I'm Jennifer McCrory, Director Curator of the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery, and we're co-hosting this artist interview with Audrey Drever uh, with the Saskatchewan Festival of Words, and we're so pleased to have you all join us for a dialogue uh, with Audrey to uh, dis discuss her practice and her use of text and language. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery and the Saskatchewan Festival of Words are situated in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Cree, Soto, uh, Ojibwe, Nakota, Dakota, Lakota, and on the uh, homeland of the Métis Nation. I'd also like to acknowledge our funders for their support. They are the Saskatchewan Arts Board, Canada Council for the Arts, SAS Culture, Sus Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canadian Heritage, Business and Arts, and the City of Moose Jaw. Uh, this artist interview is part of the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery's ongoing In Conversation series, but it's also an early kickoff event for the Festival of Words uh, Literary Arts Festival, which is, will be virtual this year, and it will be running from July 13th to 19th. Although we're approaching this dialogue as an interview, we invite you all to feel free to participate um, in the discussion by adding comments or questions uh, throughout the dialogue um, in the chat bar or chat room. Uh, to start off, I'll introduce our future artist, Audrey Drever. Audrey is Nehuwak, mm -hmm. a Plains Cree, and grew up in Prince Albert. Her family comes from Miss Mistawasis and Atakakup, Cree Nations of Saskatchewan. She received her Master of Fine Arts in painting from the University of Regina in 2015, and her Bachelor of Fine Arts in painting, printmaking, and small metal sculpture, and her Bachelor of Arts in Museum Studies and Curating and Native Art History from IAIA, the Institute of American India Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Since returning to Canada in 2008, Audrey has worked as an independent curator, consultant, and art instructor, and she's currently on faculty in the Indigenous Fine Arts Department at the First Nations University of Canada, teaching art history and studio art. Um, the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery has had the pleasure of exhibiting Audrey's work in 2017 in the exhibition, No, I Do Not Speak Cree. Her work is also currently touring the province of Saskatchewan through the Organization of Saskatchewan Art Councils in an exhibition organized by uh, the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery titled, I Do Not Have My Words which also features the work of artists Joy Arcan and Catherine Blackburn. So Audrey, I was wondering if we could start off by um, you telling us what your relationship is with uh, text and art and how you became interested in both. Um, uh, um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I guess my interest in text and art started when I was, probably started when I was really young. I, I, read a lot of comic books when I was a kid um, in the 60s and um, was always fascinated with how, you know, uh, you could see the conversation in a lot of words and then you would see these uh, frames that only had one word, but it was enough to know what was going on and how to feel or what to think was, was taking place. Um, I also watched a lot of shows like Batman you know, and when they, Batman and Robin would punch somebody, there'd be this pow and this, you know, these uh, these blasts of text that were very much like the comic book art. And so I had, um, I, I think that's where I really started. And as I grew older and I started doing different things and seeing different things, becoming more aware of the world and politics in the world, I started seeing um, art and and text uh, mel merging in a different way, in a way that could convey something really important, could uh, make a difference in how people were thinking or what they were learning and understanding. So it became really important to me that I was um, connecting to and understanding how text was used. Uh, when I started going to um, art school, when I made the decision to go to art school, that's where I really started to understand the impact that text could have in art. And that's where I learned how to um, understand its, its, its usability so that um, my, my artworks could become stronger. But I'm still feeling like I'm, you know, I still have a lot to learn. But during that time, it was 
I, I was influenced by some of the people that I was around and the people that I was researching. So uh, my primary painting instructor was an Osage painter named uh, Norman Akers. He was from Kansas, Oklahoma area. And he really Im impressed on me the understanding of how art is about the mark, about mark making. And text to me is a mark. It's an art mark. A letter is an art mark uh, at its fundamental core. And that that art mark has been associated with meaning. That meaning then is merged with other art marks that have sounds and meaning, and it turns into something more. And those are the words that carry the ideas, the intangible things that that we're thinking or saying, or you know, those things that we can't see, but we can just hear. And then that uh, the art mark is the lettering is um, the visual of representation of those sounds. So he, he helped me to understand that when text is in incorporated into art, that it's a deliberate choice. And that to create something that was in his, he felt that if you wanted to create something really strong, you had to be really uh, cognizant of the style of lettering, the placement of lettering, the color that you were using for the lettering, all those things that are um, are a component of those text marks are important. And I think the one thing that he taught me that was the most impactful was to always be really thoughtful about how you use that kind of mark in your composition, because it is an important compositional um, element. And then there was Scott Mamaday, who is a Kiowa artist. He's a writer, uh, quite well known. Um, he, I was in classes with him. Uh, he taught um, uh, oral traditions at the school that I was at, the Institute of American Indian Arts. Uh, and he talked about the, the, what happens when you transfer something oral, that oral story, oral history into the written form and how that changes things and how it uh, captures some things, but not everything. And so uh, again, being really thoughtful about the use of words and the importance and value of very, being very selective of the words that you choose. And then I had um, a, a strong interest already in an artist named Barbara Kruger, who uses a lot of text in her work. I was admiring her work before I even knew who she was, but the more that I looked into text, the more I was drawn to her work as well. I attended a workshop as a student with a guy named Edgar Heap of hers, who is, oh, excuse me, he's a Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho artist who um, uses a lot of text and graffiti style mark making in the work that he does. And he's got some significant pieces. And I think it was in that workshop with all of the other students that I was with uh, that I started to really understand um, like how the kind of thoughts and decision making that went into placement of the text. Um, graffiti artists like Banksy, I'm, I'm a big fan of Banksy's work mm -hmm. and graffiti art in general and how the, the artists can incorporate those shapes and turn them into um, meaningful representations of what they're thinking um, with the different styles of text that they use. I think that's really fascinating. Um, and I was uh, in classes alongside of a lot of young Indigenous graffiti artists who were really generous sharing their thoughts and ideas and their, you know, explaining things to me. An older woman, grandma, who didn't really know anything about graffiti. So they were they were also instrumental in helping me to understand my connection and make a stronger connection with text and art. So there's a lot of people that were involved. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. Um, um, in terms of the the body of work in the exhibition, uh, No, I Do Not Speak Cree, which was developed over a two year period during your um, MFA at the University of Regina. Um, can you tell us what was the catalyst for for that work, for that research? Um, okay, so um, when I do artwork of my own, I 
usually draw on my own experiences at, for the content. Um, I look, I, I kind of classify the work that I do as an exploration of contemporary Cree con condition. The state that we're living in, the things that we believe now, how things have changed, the shifting of, of cultural um, elements that would be significantly different had we not gone through the colonization process and had things changed so, so much. So I'm looking at myself and my own experiences, the questions that I have and using the art as a means to process it. So uh, when, I'm, when I'm doing that work, I'm usually considering how many other people have experienced the same thing. How many have uh, been through what I've been through and how many like me felt like they were the only ones alone. They were, nobody else was experiencing this stuff. And so they didn't have anybody to talk to or turn to. And so I knew that what I, whatever work I wanted to do or whatever work I decided to do as for my thesis, it was going to have an element of uh, work that can transcend being just about me and being something that other people could connect to. And in that way, the work would be um, of, of use to more than just me to hang on my wall or to say, oh, this was my experience. So when, when I was thinking about um, the content specifically, what, what experience was I going to convey? I had several ideas of what I wanted to do and it ended up because of my friend's mother who had a short-term memory loss issue, um, repeatedly asking me this question, do you speak Cree, do you speak Cree? And the and becoming aware of the anxiety that I was feeling when she asked me that, and I couldn't answer with a yes. Um, I, I guess that's what kind of pulled me towards that, uh, that particular topic. I was going over a list of things with my advisor, my MFA advisor, and in that conversation, um, I, was, I decided to go with the, the language loss. It was one of half a dozen or so topics I was thinking about presenting or working on exploring. Okay. Um, and um, you've talked a little bit about how you've tried to um, learn Cree yourself and, and uh, connect to your culture through the language. Um, and so I, I, as I understand it, you in looking, creating this body of work, you were um, looking at the impact of the Cree language loss on yourself and your family, um, but also uh, grappling with um, per not, perhaps not having a grasp of it and how to, um, how that affects your own cultural identity. Is that right? Oh, well, I've been experiencing this since, going through this since I was, um, the youngest I can remember was in grade five at an elementary school I went to in Prince Albert. Uh, maybe grade four, no, it would be grade five. Um, I was, we were bused from the area that we lived to the school that's uh, now in the downtown area where the mall is now sitting. And um, there were kids from the Midtown area who were all uh, non-native. And there were kids that were bused in from the residential school in Prince Albert. Uh, and so I was suddenly stuck between these two groups of, of kids that I clearly didn't belong to either one. And, it, and so when I, I remember the, one of the kids from the residential school said, uh, so are, who are you? <laughs> so I told him, she said, so are you like, are you Cree? Are you an Indian? I said, uh, I didn't know <laughs> what to say because the, the term didn't mean anything to me. I'd, like I'd never, I'd never consciously been aware of being an Indian. I was just me. I was a dreamer. I was Audrey. My mom and dad spoke Cree. All my aunts and uncles spoke Cree. And then they talked English to us. Like that's, that's my reality. 
So I said, well, I don't know, what's an Indian? <laughs> so she said, well, do you come from a reserve? And I said, well, we're from Mistawasis. Oh, so you are an Indian. And then she started speaking Cree to me and I couldn't answer her. <laughs> well, you're not a real Indian then. <laughs> and she walked away. So that was grade five. So I've been grappling with this concept of not speaking my language since then. And I'm 60, I'm almost 64 now. So it's been a while. Great, great. Um, are you, uh, could you talk a little bit about um, your family's history? with that um, and how, um, like as you, I remember walking through the gallery and you um, share uh, bits of stories of your interactions with your own children, with your grandchildren, um, and then sort of looking back, you can see that you're looking at pictures of your parents um, and, um, and your sibling, you've incorporated pictures of your s siblings as well. There's that one of so small, and I believe it's your um, image of your sister as a young girl walking up in front of the school. Um, and so coming to terms with, um, um, you were asking, it seems like you were asking lots of questions just to try to um, figure out how you, how your family came to lose um, its connection to Cree. Yeah, yeah, I've been looking at this issue for a long time and not not consciously working through it every day, all day, but I keep coming back to it and throughout my life I've come back to it and things have happened where I felt like um, it was really prominent, it was a prominent issue. Uh, when I, like the the day that I was talking to the little girl from that was from the residence at the school. Um, then I lived in this place in Alberta called Small Boy Camp. And that was, uh, that was all Cree families that were there. And predominantly they spoke Cree to each other. They, all the kids knew Cree, but I didn't. And that bothered me. And, and then as a, as I became a mother and I started going to, ceremonies and different cultural based activities and people around me speaking Cree and I couldn't fit in couldn't I, I sometimes would be okay but most of the times I found myself really uncomfortable uh, especially if things were not if I wasn't being accepted because I couldn't speak Cree it was really uncomfortable and then um, I talked to my mom and dad a few times about Cree but we never, we never were taught. I remember being asked one time when I was just little, if we wanted to learn Cree, but I don't, I think that I said no, and I don't understand why. So what my, that was in that, you know, that time period when people were embarrassed to be native or people wanted to hide their native identity, but I was still struggling. I was so young. I was struggling with, like, I didn't know what was, it was a strange language that they were talking. So I, I, there was discomfort there. And, and then as a mother, my, and as my kids got older, but in different workplaces where we lived, people would ask me about speaking Cree and, and I couldn't teach my kids. And then they got older and, well, how do you say this in Cree, mom? And I couldn't tell them. I tell them, go call your grandma. Talk to your grandma, your grandma will know. And then uh, my grandchildren, you know, taking my granddaughter to a ceremony, which is one of the paintings, and her being afraid because the man who was speaking was speaking in such an angry voice. And he was speaking in Cree, and she felt like, she asked me if she did something wrong, if she was bad, and was he mad at her. And I couldn't comfort her because I did not, I didn't know what he was saying. I couldn't translate it. And so there's that intergenerational thing, right? And my parents spoke Cree right up till they passed away. My mother was 85 and she still, whenever she had a chance, she spoke Cree. Um, but none of us learned. And so the conversations that I had with my mother included asking her what happened. Well, how, like, how did my oldest sister understood Cree? I witnessed it. But I didn't understand Cree, so how could that be? 
and she talked about the incident where my sister was five and completely fluent, went to school um, and was dropped and sent home because she was speaking Cree. Her and a couple of other little kids were trying to help each other and they got strapped. And so after, you know, several debates and I guess some arguments that took place between the parents that night, because they were also angry, it was decided that the best way to keep their kids safe was to not speak Cree to them anymore because they had to send us to school. We were in a public school. We were not in a residential school. We were in a public Prince Albert school, a uh, provincial school, Saskatchewan school, and we were expected to speak only English. So I came along six kids later. I'm the second youngest of seven or five kids later. And by then they were committed to only speaking Cree to their kids. So, you know, processing all of that, understanding what it was that they went through, because it wasn't just my sister that was traumatized. It was my parents too. They, their ability to parent and their authority and their right to be the authority on how to discipline their child was removed from them the day that she was strapped and sent home with a note. So there's, you know, this, it, all these layers, these complex layers of, of things that took place that resulted in me um, sitting with my granddaughter at that ceremony, unable to help her to feel comfortable and safe. Uh, up to that point, she would, she was, we'd walk into those spaces and she was, it was like she was home. She'd walk around visiting people. She'd be enjoying the feast and she'd be dancing. And, you know, she was five years old, I think, when that happened, four or five years old. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't a pleasant time for me. So I, and I've tried learning Cree throughout my life. I've spent over 20 years trying to learn Cree. <laughs> I still can't, I don't, for whatever reason, I can't keep the words in my head. I cannot retain them and recall them so that I can be uh, uh, in a conversation, that I could say I'm even semi-fluent. And then that results in, you know, when I'm working with youth or with art students who want to put their language into the into their piece, but they don't know their language either, I can't help them. I'm totally reliant on finding fluent speakers who can help them. So there's that, that layer of not being able to assist my students as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like it's it becomes a complex thing, and um, I've come to terms with the fact that I may not learn my language before I pass away, and you know I'm okay with that because I understand what my parents were doing when they made that choice. They were keeping us safe, and I'm and so I've come to terms with all of that, but it doesn't make it easier. <laughs> You know, I still, I still struggle. I still argue with myself about, you know, inside my head, I'm arguing with myself about whether this is right or should I do this or, you know, when it comes to the language and putting Cree into my artwork, it's not an easy, it's not an easy decision to work with. Right. Um, just, I'm kind of, um, as you're speaking, I'm looking at the images, um, the, the, um, slideshow of of the work that was featured in the exhibition no i do not speak cree and and um the self portraiture that um and uh, references to family um can you talk a bit about why you decided to um represent yourself and your family in silhouette in sort of that abstracted yeah, yeah. that kind of came about accidentally um I was doing my first piece. I knew that what I wanted to convey, uh, it's called the phone call. And it's about a conversation that I would have with my sons. My oldest son, I had more conversations with him than the younger one, but they were both chefs. And so when they were doing new menus, they'd call me and they'd say, well, how do you say this? Do you say, how do you say this? And did we have a word for this? Did we even have this? And I kept saying, call your grandma, call your grandma. Your grandma will know, call your grandma. She'll be happy to hear from you. Because all I could say was, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to say that. I don't think we have that. But, you know, your grandma will know. And, uh, and then she passed away, and we didn't have that resource anymore. All of a sudden, there was this huge void of uh, presence. And 
And so when I when I I knew that I wanted to how I wanted to set it up, but my issue was me. So I started painting myself in the first figure, and then I I didn't like it. I thought this isn't what I want. So I grayed it out. What I do is if I don't like something, I'll paint gray over it, gray it out, and then start over. So I grayed it out, and I thought, oh, this is crazy. I'm frustrated. I don't know what to do. So I went to lunch, <laughs> and when I came back. And came around the corner and saw that painting. That silhouette really stood out for me. And that's when I decided to do the silhouette. And I did it in two grays, just so that it didn't look like a blob. I wanted it to you to be able to differentiate the figure from whatever the figure was connected to. So uh, that's the two grays. And so then once I started looking at the silhouette, considering the silhouette made the decision to put it in. Then I started looking at other works that have silhouettes. And Kara Walker, of course, is one of the um, most, um, I think, recognized person, artist doing silhouette work. She does her work about uh, the antebellum period and of the, of the South. And, um, so I was looking at her work and looking at how she used those shapes and those figures. And then I started, uh, I researched, I, I really like um, Kumi, Kumi Yamashita. She does a lot of silhouette work. And what she does is it's, it's cast shadow. Most of her work is cast shadow. And then uh, as I was coming into the program, Rowan Pantel was uh, just finishing her MFA and she did a lot of work with cut paper and silhouette cast shadow from uh, silhouettes from cast shadow. So I was looking at how all of these different artists were using silhouette and um, I, I just went from there. And I wasn't really sure if it was going to work until I exhibited those first two paintings, the phone call at the McKenzie and in the Moving Forward Never Forgetting exhibit. And that was, um, that was where I, from that point forward, I knew I was on the right track because I wanted my own self or my family's figures in the image. Um, but I wanted them in a way that, yes, it's my story, but other people could insert themselves into that space and so that they could feel like they were connected to this too. They could use this as a, as a means to say, yeah, that happened to me too. I understand that experience and it was, and it worked. It worked really well. So yeah, yeah the, the silhouette is, um, it's sort of a neutralized abstracted form. So it does allow people, I think, to incorporate themselves, but it's so, it's so powerful too, um, in the work. So, yeah. Um, I also wondered, um, the, the text that you've incorporated in the work you've, um, in, Put them in as speech balloons and sort of there's a reflection of like sort of intimate conversations with people um or inner dialogue as well and um um i just wondered if you could talk to why you decided to present the text that way well i i think i, I just kept going back to comic books you know and, and when i was growing up comic books weren't really considered an art but they are now they're a genre of art and I, I just kept going back and thinking about how much they influenced me and how they used text. And I, I didn't know anything about how comic book art was done, like how decisions were made. Um, so I did research on that too. And it was Scott McCloud's books that really helped me to understand the process of picking and like selecting text, selecting fonts, positioning the text in, uh, you know, sizing it, doing all of those compositional things that Norman Akers had talked to me about being really important elements. And so um, I turned to comic book art, graphic art, to, um, because I want it, it's a story that I want people to read. And I think that's the best way to explain it. It's, you know, you go into the gallery, there's one painting that is always the beginning of that exhibit and one painting that's always the last in the exhibit for specific reasons. And the rest of them are my experience throughout my life. And I feel that everything that was 
like the ones that are together remain together. But it, it's to go in there and see that first piece and then look at that, read it as a story as you walk around or through the gallery. Um, I, I just kept connecting it to comic book art and that flow from frame to frame that they use. And so that's how I ended up with those speech bubbles. And, you know, I looked at all different ways of putting text in there. And I ended up, I thought that the best solution that worked for me and what I was envisioning was that, that bubble, that speech bubble that you find uh, in the comic book art. And positioning it, you know, the sizing it and, and positioning it really tight together or really close to the figure or filling the space or just, you know, being in one spot off to the side somewhere there, but not fully connected or there having a specific kind of impact. Um, so I, yeah, it was comic book art, you know, looking at, I, I look at all kinds of art and I teach native art history. So I'm all constantly looking at art, the way people make art, the kinds of uh, mediums they use, the processes that they go through to position their composition, create their composition. I, I look a lot at art and from all of the things that I was drawing from, um, that's what stood out. That would be the best approach for me was the comic book art. Except for the three pieces that are full text. That's that's a different thing. <laughs> right. That's a different process. Right. Yeah, I remember how the, the exhibition was laid out. The text base works were sort of front and center. And then as you move through the space, the text would gradually fall away. And so the the um the narrative within the picture sort of took over. Um and um I, I know that you've talked about um, looking at um, like images as a form of language or communication. You've, you've already t talked a little bit about that. Um, but I remember you mentioning um, pictographs and uh, hide paintings as well was something that um, you, you were sort of thinking as a referencing, I guess, as well. Yeah. Well, that was a form of visual and communication. Yeah, and that's part of, I think that's part connected to my being Cree, my, my understanding of place and self as a Cree woman and as a Cree painter or artist, because it's a visual language. It's a language too. The images are languages. They're mnemonic devices, just like that art mark that has become uh, associated with sound, the alphabet, the group of art marks that are the alphabet. Uh, those images and shapes are also the same kind of thing. They represent, they carry. They carry stories, they carry meaning, they carry sounds. And you know, when I did the work, I didn't even notice that I had, that the, the text fell away until it was hanging in the gallery the first time. And at a point there was no more text. And I thought that can't be right. Maybe I've missed, you know, put things out of order, but it was the order that I went. It was the order that I created them in. And so as um, I guess in the end, it was an exercise in connecting the concept of language to that indigenous place that I come from, that Cree place and um, how those uh, those things like the, the petroglyphs and the pictographs and the hide paintings, how they represent and carry such meaning, even though we don't understand what they all mean. Maybe we can't read those hide paintings anymore like they could in, in the old days, but they're still representing a, of something, a, a experience that is meaningful and important. And so those last pieces with no text became that, I guess. I, I didn't even, like I said, I didn't even notice that was happening until after the pieces were all up. So that was kind of cool. Kind of, it was just like drawn, naturally drawn that way. Like I was naturally drawn to that. It wasn't an intentional thing. Um, we just have a question here from Sarah. She's saying, I was wondering what audiences, if any, you had in mind for this work. 
You mentioned people with similar experiences, but were you hoping others would connect or learn in some way? Um, I'll let you answer that one first. Okay. Um, actually, I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, when it turned out that people from other nationalities were also connecting to the work. It didn't occur to me that when Europeans came as part of the colonization process, they were, they lost their languages too. They were forced in different ways, like we were, to speak only English because they were in Canada now. And I ended up having a lot of conversations with uh, a variety of people from who had different backgrounds. Um, from different parts of Europe, their ancestry came from Europe, and none of them could speak their, their mother tongue. And that actually happened when I exhibited my work in Vienna. And when I was invited to Vienna, Austria, um, I thought to myself, like, what is my work going to say in Vienna, which is one of the major art capitals of Europe? You know, a thousand years of art history, like significant art history. What's my work going to say there? And the curator said, uh, you'd be surprised how many people will connect to language law. I thought, okay, well, whatever, it, I'll trust you. So I went. And like the people that I met here, um, a lot of them don't have their mother tongue. In fact, there was only one woman. I met all together in a, over the course of the week that I was there. I met about 100 people who lived there, who were, they were European and um, only one could speak their mother tongue. The rest of them had lost their, their languages, just like we had. And it didn't occur to me that that was part of the colonization process, making everybody speak the same colonizer's language. And so that opened up a whole new area of me, for me to think about and for me to talk about when I present my work. Um, because there's just so much of that. And that, that's an indication that in Canada, when we say, when Indigenous people say, well, we're all colonized, this is a good example of how we are all colonized. We're all indoctrinated to do things a certain way, to think a certain way, to believe certain things, and to speak English. And even, you know, French Canada, there was a period where... Um, the French, French was the second official language, but in Saskatchewan, French people were being arrested and put in jail for speaking French. You know, even though it was a second official language of North America, of Canada. So it, it changed the way that I saw how my work could reach others besides Indigenous people. And it's actually, again, um, I had that same experience in the Moving Forward Never Forgetting exhibit where people from different nationalities and even when it was in the Moose Chunk Gallery, I had people come and talk to me about how they, they couldn't speak to their grandparents in Europe or they, they, their kids didn't speak the language and didn't want to learn the language and I don't know what to do because it's important that they stay connected to the language. So. I don't think it's for just Indigenous peoples. I think it's the, the issue is language loss. We went to public school, we did not go to residential school, and we lost our language just the same. Uh, the Métis people, you know, the Métis kids lost their language. The, um, the immigrant kids from all over, all over, all over Europe, all over the world lost their language if they came at a certain time and were expected to speak only English. So. It's not a, just an Indigenous experience. The issue, the difference, though, is there's one major difference, and that is um, people can go back to their countries of origin and, and reconnect to their language. But if Indigenous peoples lose their language, it's gone. For, it's gone. There's, there's no way to bring it back. We don't have any other place to go to recapture our language. So there's, there's that. And I think that that has an impact on people who are not Indigenous, who think about how they're connected to the work. Um, thanks, Audrey. Um, uh, Sarah also asked if you're working on any new projects now, and if you are, does text words appear on the new work as well? Yes, I'm doing a couple of things. Um, there's the teapot that's shown, 
Uh, that teapot, um, it's called A Letter to My Ancestors, um, is about the day that I had tea with my mom when she told me what happened, why they decided to quit speaking Cree to us. And um, I did another small set of pieces that I showed in Vienna that was also re related to that. And in that I use syllabics and I want to expand on that because the, the only image in it, aside from the syllabics that are handwritten are um, teacup stains, the, the rings of the bottom of a teacup. Um, and it's about her holding that cup of tea so tight when she was talking to me. I'm also, uh, so I'm working on this installation piece that is about my siblings and I having tea with mom and dad. And those uh, paper shaped formed um, object will have the, the teacup, or the teapot and all the teacups will have syllabic English and syllabics embedded in the, in the paper. Uh, Cause that paper is, um, Using, using UV silkscreen processes, I uh, the paper has alphabet English alphabet and it also has some syllabics in it. So I'll, I'm using that kind of paper to create these objects. And I'm also working on a, a series of, a, well, it's a triptych really. It's three paintings that connect to a medicine teaching or a medicine recipe that was left by my great grandmother one of my aunts translated it took i was asking her before she passed away about some of the medicines and they um she wrote it down and translated it into english and wrote it down recorded it and there's a phrase in that medicine recipe that made no sense to me i'd never heard it before um it was about when to pick the medicine plant and so i want to I've, I've got the images all um, set up. I know how I want to create the paintings. There are three paintings. And it will be about that plant and the translation of the information from Cree to English and how it was written down. And how I'm, me as somebody who wasn't part of the conversation, couldn't ask additional questions. I'm trying to figure out what it means. So, and that will have, the plant will be in silhouette. And then um, there will be, I'm anticipating some text in that as well. So it's not over. <laughs> and I love text in art. I think text can really have, it can really enhance an, an artwork. It can, it can give it more power. Um, so I'm not finished with exploring text in art yet. Mm. I was also thinking, I, I loved your comment about how text is, you see it as a form of mark making. Like it's, it's a visual image, um, it's a visual element within an image, but it's the mark making. And so I was thinking that syllabics, now that you, your work is incorporating syllabics as well, like that, it's, it's visual and it, um, you know, it has this beautiful sort of uh, look at like calligraphy and um, like mark making. Just wondered if you saw it that way. Um, I mostly see it as something really profoundly different from the lettering. And when you see something in syllabics, you know that it's connected to something else, something more, something deeper. Right. When I cura I'm a curator as well. And when I curate some of the exhibits that I've curated, I have, or projects that I've worked on, I've incorporated um, syllabics in the titles because when you see syllabics you know it's different it's not just a, I, I coordinated a conference on human rights for the Ariel Sallows chair in 2012 I think and we we called the um, conference Etotomasia which loosely translated means our way like we're not our ways like it what you're doing or what you, you've told us to do doesn't work for us so we're gonna do things the way we know it will work so like a much deeper meaning than just our way 
but um, instead of just using the letters, the English lettering, I had the term translated into syllabics. And that's what we used was the syllabics. And everyone knew that it was a conference on law, indigenous lawmaking and its connection to the uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But when they saw those syllabics, they knew it was going to be different. It's going to be something more, something deeper, something else than what a standard or typical law conference would be. And it was, it was a profound thing. So for me, when syllabics are included, it changes it. And people understand when they see it that it's something more. It's not an English concept and it's different. It's deeper and it's more meaningful to me as the artist. So I'm, I'm when I see our syllabics or, or images of lettering that uh, connects to any of the indigenous cultures actually anywhere in the world, I see something deeper. So that's how I approach syllabics. And in the tea bags, in the piece that's showing right now, um, the letter that the letter to my ancestors uh, is broken into short phrases, which I um, had I, I wrote with edible ink on uh, some paper, watercolor paper, and I put those phrases, the amalgamation of all of the syllabic shapes, on those little dots of paper I placed inside each tea bag, so you can actually drink the tea. It's it's drinkable. Um, and uh, and then you're drinking those words, right? You're drinking something that's coming from that. Right? What what when that paper and that edible ink is absorbed in the water, then it becomes part of the tea. So you're then drinking it, um, finding ways to bring that connect the person to those syllabic shapes even more. And that was important to me that it was in syllabics that was handwritten and that it was um, just randomly placed in, in the bag. So each tea bag, you don't know which part of which phrase you're, you're, you're drinking. Yeah. <laughs> but it's pretty cool. I, I quite like that idea. Right. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting that you're using um, the tea and um, the teapot in this work. Um, and I've seen um, other Indigenous artists refer to the act of drinking tea, um, you know, as sort of a coming together of community and um, um, whether the tea is a medicine. Um, um, can you talk a little bit about that, how it's sort of the um, sharing and oral stories and um, sense of community? Um, and connecting to your culture? Sure, the sure. <clears throat> so the, I think in Cree households, anyway, Cree households I grew up in and know, the most active place in the house is in the kitchen where the table is and there's always tea on or coffee on. Uh, we have, we, we like tea, Cree people like tea. <laughs> We just like tea. We like it when we're out camping. We like it when we're berry picking. We like it when we're just, you know, walking on the land. We like it in the kitchen when we're visiting. And my parents, as soon as somebody was coming in, they saw them driving up to the house. They put the tea kettle on. They made tea right away. And so it, a lot of the conversations that I had, if not all of them, about language with my mom, we were always drinking tea. And with tea, you know, you go in and have tea with somebody and you just think, okay, well, I'm going to ask about this. I'm going to talk about this. But you really never know where that conversation is going to go. And a lot of times that it goes to a really profound place. And so that process of sharing that teapot becomes even more significant to the people who are drinking the tea. Um, I know the Japanese have a tea ceremony and I love that idea. We don't have a tea ceremony as far as I know, but I love the idea of it being something really, something more than just sipping the liquid. 
when we when we would have tea at our house uh, with my mom or when I'd visit my sisters or whoever and we were having tea, we always had great conversations. So it, it's like it, the sharing of food, you know, it brings people together. And I, ha I have, um, I know that our teas, our, our historical teas were medicines. They helped to heal us, even if they were just nourishing us with fluid, they were also healing us. And it, and I know that the teas from India, which is what we predominantly drink now, they're also medicines. So there's a, there's a whole other layer of value that you can place on the drinking of tea. But in our family, it was something that we shared with people that we cared about and, um, and shared when, you know, where things were tough, when we we're going through tough things and hurting and, you know, sad or afraid or, you know, tea helped us, tea calmed us down it, and it helped us feel comfort. So the, you know, the conversations that I had with my mother around the pre-language and language loss, you know, that was the, the tea that we shared ended up creating conversations that I never expected. So it was important. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we're... Um coming up near um, the end here and so I just want I was just going to ask if there's any other questions from anyone that is uh, streaming in um, please feel free to um, type any questions in um, it's it the time has gone by really fast it's been uh, enjoyed the the conversation Audrey so um, thank you for this and um, if we don't see any other questions, um, maybe I will, um, I'll wrap up by saying thank you, Audrey, uh, for agreeing to do this today and for um, sharing um, the, um, the intimate work um, and powerful work um, that you've done um, and um, that you're continuing to do. And um, thank you also to the Festival of Words for uh, providing this opportunity uh, to allow the Moustra Museum and Art Gallery to partner on this. Um, we've um, I've really enjoyed the conversation with Audrey and um, please uh, stay tuned for in conversation series that we have in the future. And um, yeah, and thanks to all of you who have logged in and um, participated. It, um, we appreciate appreciate the support. Um, inviting interesting different way of being interviewed. <laughs>